associates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a great pleasure and an honor to welcome you all to this Holberg Symposium in honor of the 2023 Holberg Laureate, Joan Martinez Salier. My name is Kjerste Frutte, and I'm the chair of the Holberg Board, which annually awards the Holberg Prize to outstanding scholars in the humanities, social sciences, law, and theology. We welcome you that are here present in the University Aula in Bergen, as well as all of you that follow the event on live stream from around the world. This symposium marks the beginning of this year's Holberg Week, where we offer a week of celebrations and several academic events with the participation of outstanding scholars. As you may know, the Holberg Prize is one of the most prestigious prizes awarded to outstanding scholars in the fields that the prize covers. It was established by the Norwegian government in 2003 in homage to the scientist and writer Ludwig Holberg, who lived from 1684 to 1754. The Holberg Prize is administered by the University of Bergen on behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. And this year, 2023, is the 20th anniversary of the Holberg Prize. We are therefore delighted to celebrate this anniversary event through today's symposium. Now, for the Holberg Symposium, the laureate is asked to propose a topic as well as the persons with whom he would like to converse. So we look very much forward to taking part in the presentations and discussions during this year's symposium in honor of Juan Martinez Allier, who has chosen the timely topic, World Movements for Environmental Justice. And to present the laureate and the symposium speakers, I hereby give the floor to the academic director of the Holberg Prize, Professor Bjorn Engen Bertelsen, to be moderating the event. So please, Bjorn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tersti, uh, and good morning to everyone. I am, as Chasti mentioned, very pleased to take on the task of moderating the Holberg Symposium in honor of the 2023 Holberg Laureate, Juan Martinez Allier. We are also extremely happy to have three symposiasts with us here in Bergen, and we look forward to them sharing their insights on the topic, as Chasti mentioned, called World Movements for Environmental Justice. Not a small topic. The laureate and the three symposium speakers, Silvio Funtovic, Ksenia Hanacek, and Brototi Roy, will all contribute to making sense of this topic, and we do really look forward to the interventions from all of you. But before we delve into the symposium topic, please let me introduce the 2023 Holberg laureate, Juan Martinez Allier. Professor Martinez Allier is the world leading scholar of ecological economics, political ecology, and environmental justice. His transdisciplinary research integrates social and natural sciences, proposing a humanities driven form of economics. He's based at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, UAB, in the Department of Economics and Economic History. Martinez Allier is a highly influential scholar in fields ranging from anthropology, geography, environmental studies, and political economy, to agrarian studies and the analysis of food systems. He's a major figure and leading public intellectual in the burgeoning movement for degrowth and agroecology. Analytically clear, his critiques of mainstream economic theory raise questions about the dominant focus on economic growth as the sole metric of a good economy. His approach rejects economic models based on extracting resources from the environment to support material accumulation and consumption. 
Instead, his economic framework centers human and environmental flourishing, creating an alternative pluralistic theory of value for determining economic judgments. The empirical basis of his theory draws on extensive and long-term research conducted in a variety of global contexts, including Latin America. Based on participatory research methods, his analysis emerges from dialogue with indigenous and non-Western forms of life and of knowledge. A central concern of Martinez Allier's work is how environmental questions are inseparable from analysis of historical injustices and ongoing inequalities. These injustices create, raise questions concerning the ecologic, ecological debt that so-called developed nations owe formerly colonized countries. Two of his most influential books are Ecological Economics, Energy, Environment and Society, published with Klaus Schlupmann in 1987, and The Environmentalism of the Poor, a study of ecological conflicts and valuations from 2002. The first book, Ecological Economics, trace the history of ecological critiques of economics from the 1860s to the 1940s. It was a major catalyst in the development of political ecology through its articulation of a different tradition of economic thought. The second book, The Environmentalism of the Poor, examines the relationship between environmental conflicts and poverty. The book overturns assumptions that there is a necessary conflict between the improving be, be, apologies, between improving the economic well-being of the poor and attaining environmental sustainability. Martinez Allier is a founding member of the International Society for Ecological Economics. He also founded the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology, ICTA UAB, at the Universitat. Autonoma de Barcelona. The Institute is a multidisciplinary center promoting the study of the nature and causes of environmental problems and seeks constructive policies that enable transition to a sustainable economy. A key part of its work is the Environmental Justice Atlas that documents environmental justice struggles from around the world. Martinez Allier has the unusual distinction of both anticipating and actively engaging with the interrelated planetary challenges of poverty, climate change, and food security. His innovative theories and mentorship continue to build the capacity of new scholars and policymakers to address these intersecting crises of global economic life. By any standard, Professor Martinez Allier's achievements are truly remarkable. It is therefore a great privilege for us to be able to organize this symposium in his honor today. I now give the floor to Professor Juan Martinez Allier, who will introduce the topic for the Holberg Symposium entitled World Movements for Environmental Justice. Welcome, Professor Martinez Allier. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for this honor, and thank you to you for being here. And the symposium takes the form, as Bjorn has explained, of that, this short introduction by myself, and then uh, Silvio Funtovic and Senia Hanasek and Brototi Roy will join me here, I think, and we are going to uh, discuss the topic of, uh, of the symposium, which is this uh, ambitious title of World Movements for Environmental Justice. It should be like a question mark at the end because the question, I, well, even myself, I'm not sure that there is a world movement for environmental justice. And this is a topic not only of this symposium, it's the topic of a forthcoming book of which you can see the cover here. The book is finished, but it's in the, in the press until October or November at the earliest, 
and it has many chapters, and I will comment on one of the chapters in a minute or so. So, a book doesn't show that something exists. I think that the Holbert Prize this year is given to me, and also to, to another younger scholar who works on fact and fiction. So, one could bring two things together, and whether environmental justice is fact or fiction. I think it should be facts, actually. I am a vulgar empiricist scholar, in a way. And this is the, the screen for the elders of environmental justice, should be called the elders of environmental injustices or environmental conflicts, and we have now nearly 4,000 cases. This is, of course, a collective work, and the prize is a collective prize, in my view, to ecological economics, which still has not enough room in universities, political ecology, which I'm sure is not taught in many Scandinavian universities, if at all, and to environmental justice. So this is, a, I see this, of course, as a collective prize, and I am just a representative of these new ways of looking at the relation between natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. I wouldn't include theology, although I respect theology very much, and Holberg himself practiced also theology. So this is what uh, the Aldous is about. It's about uh, conflicts around the world, and it's coded by color depending on the conflicts, and we are keeping adding new conflicts all the time, and we are going to reach 4,000 before the end of the year. And what is important is now is the analysis of these conflicts. Just today is a coincidence in some ways. Well, first, because my birthday, actually. But second, more importantly, is because Senia Hanasik, who is going to speak, she has just published an article with a colleague in Nature Sustainability based on the others and listing women activists killed around the world and analyzing who these women active women environmental defenders are. This was not foreseen beforehand, all these coincidences, isn't it? And uh, so that's what the other is for, is for the analysis of comparative uh, statistical, perhaps political ecology. And this is a, a summary which I sent for this symposium that the, the making of these movements come from the conflicts, and the conflicts come from the growth and the changes in the social metabolism. That is the flows of energy and materials, and this is where the more ecological or natural sciences or engineering parts come together. We observe the flows of energy and materials and the changes, like now, with this electrical transition which is going to come, and the conflicts that arise, for instance, on lithium mining in some place in Finland, for instance, right now, isn't it? Or copper mining or nickel mining. But also the old conflicts about coal and gas and, 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 and oil extraction and so on. All these conflicts have material causes from the point of commodity extraction, but also of waste disposal. And climate change is a big uh, waste disposal conflict, in a way, because what are we going to locate all the excessive amounts of carbon dioxide that the world economy is producing, isn't it? Where? In the oceans? Well, the oceans are filled, isn't it? And they're becoming acidified. Or in the new vegetation, well, this is something I'll discuss in some other occasion during the week, this kind of red conflicts. And then just to finish, I want to show one of the chapters in the book, which is this chapter, which I think Silvia Funtovich will also mention. And it, this is one of the 30 cup chapters in the book. And it's about one of the aspects of this conflict. And I want you to show this as a to prepare the public for Silvio Funtovich, because we have prepared it beforehand, obviously. It's another coincidence, but this one was prepared beforehand, who is going to talk more about post-normal science. So in the book, there is a chapter with some conflicts, selected conflicts from the others, selected by myself, because in my book, 
although it's also a collective book. So there are some conflicts in, in well, these conflicts in, in, in Namibia, Rio Tinto, but also in America there are some conflicts, of course, in which scientists are involved. This is the point of this chapter. The involvement of scientists together with NGOs, together with peasants perhaps, together with farmers, with citizens and neighbors and even religious groups sometimes, who are the protagonists of these conflicts from the point of view of justice, isn't it? This is the main topic of the symposium of my life, one could say in the last 40 years, and of the prize also, which are the protagonists, who are the protagonists of these conflicts. So here in this chapter, I focus on the scientists in America, some examples, also in South America, in South Africa, in Asia, for instance, in Mongolia, this copper mining, uh, Oyu Tongoy, an enormous copper mine just in the border with China, in which some scientists, in fact, in this case, Robert Goulden, who worked for a long time in the World Bank, and then he retired. He was one of the first ecological economists, a great friend of Herman Daly. He was involved. He went there. He went there and he gave a, a, a report, which of course did not stop the mine at all, because the mine is too important to be for the Chinese economy to be stopped. So I have these examples, which of course I'm not going to go on on this, just to introduce one part of what will be said later about post-normal science and environmental conflicts, which is something that we had not thought about until a few years ago, isn't it? This connection between the study of environmental conflicts around the world and all the development about the role of scientists and post-normal science. And this links, of course, very much with last year, or very much, or at least to some extent, with last year, Holbert Prize winner, who was uh, Sheila Yas Yas Nasov, uh, who is uh, well known in the field of science, technology, and society. This is what I am talking about here, actually. So thank you very much, and then we shall continue, I think, with the full team, isn't it? In a few minutes. You have more time, but you can... Thank you. So Martinez Allier, we now move to the symposium speakers who have all been recommended by the laureate. Each speaker has been asked to prepare their respective 20-minute presentations. And the first speaker this morning is Silvio Funtovic, who is already ready to go onto the stage, but I'll present you a bit first. Silvio Funtovic has a long career straddling both several disciplines and several continents much like our laureate, I think. He began by teaching mathematics, logic, and research methodology in Buenos Aires before proceeding to become a research fellow at the University of Leeds, England, in the 1980s. Until his retirement in 2011, he was a scientific officer at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Silvio Funtovic also has a long-standing connection to the University of Bergen, as he was from 2012 until 2021, an adjunct professor at the Center for the Study of Sciences and the Humanities, where he continues to be a guest researcher. Academically speaking, he can be described as a philosopher of science active in the field of science and technology studies. For instance, in one of his publications, co-authored with Jerome Ravetz, he has dealt with uncertainty and quality in science for policy. Funtovich has also worked on linking reflections on the quality of science used for policy to environmental and technological risks and policy-related research. In this latter aspect of his work, he has developed a notational system for the management and communication of uncertainty in science for policy, a system given the acronym NUSAP. Last but not least, Funtovich has worked extensively with the concept of post-normal science since the 1990s, 
and his article entitled Science for the Post-Normal Age, published in the journal Futures, is widely cited. The title of his presentation today is A Political Epistemology for Environmental Justice. Dr. Funtovic, the floor and microphone and everything else is yours. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure and it's emo very emotional for me to come back to Bergen uh, after the COVID pandemic. So last time I was here for 2019. So it's, it's really an honor and a pleasure. Now, uh, uh, this uh, slide is to show that my relation with Joanne is not only intellectual and political, but it is also personal. And as you know, uh, relationships that go over 30, 40 years are complex, okay? Now, uh, uh, and, uh, so, uh, because they are complex and long and full of episodes and life experiences, I will concentrate on three episodes that help to understand uh, the coevolution of our thinking. And, of course. Now, uh, uh, the title, as you see, uh, uh, the title you mentioned, uh, Bjorn, is a shorter because it was the num maximum number of characters I was allowed, but I think it's important to say it's not only environmental, it's also health conflicts, okay? Uh, and now, I, uh, the title I talked about, uh, Political ep Epistemology, which is a, a concept I haven't been using lately, but it goes back to original our original work and my relation with Joanne. Uh, here uh, you can see on the top is uh, the first translation, uh, a Spanish published in Buenos Aires, of our work, uh, and the title is Political Epistemology. And sub subtitle, Science with the People. Uh, uh, Joanne uh, uh, convinced uh, Icaria with a publisher in Barcelona to have a second edition of the book, and it is there from 1990. Uh, and unfortunately, in the title, political epistemology disappeared, but still, uh, in science, it appears the name of post-normal science and science with the people. Now, uh, what is interesting about this is the, uh, is the foreword by, uh, by Joanne. And, uh, in this, I won't go into details, but uh, it will stay here. Uh, first, Joan to, uh, tells how we met, and also why he invited us to the conference in 1997 in Barcelona, which is, was the foundational conference on ecological economics. Okay, and on the top you could see about the conference published by what is the Institute of Studies Catalans. Uh, and also, uh, in the second paragraph I have it highlighted is Joanne explaining why he invited us. And it is interesting because he provides some clues about Joanne's uh, uh, philosophy of science, understanding of science, ideas of science important, it's very influential. Uh, so, uh, uh, we can say that this conference, uh, Joanne and the people we met, the community I met in Barcelona, when I say we, I refer also to uh, uh, my long-standing partner, uh, Jerry Ravitz, who is 94 now, and still going strong like us, you know, still crazy, as after all these years, as Paul Simon used to say. And, uh, and we can say that uh, 87 and the conference was a watershed in our uh, uh, development, intellectual development. Because before, and we were invited, and Joan mentions that, we were working on a critique of quantitative reasoning in risk assessment. And after uh, the conference, it develops into what we call a quality of knowledge inputs to policy decision-making and political action. One of the elements of interest in, in Joanne's understanding of, of the philosophy of science is Otto Neurath, uh, who was 
uh, at the Vienna Circle. I won't go into details, but I highlighted this uh, paragraph because it is quite interesting. And it is uh, Neurath's idea about the orchestration of sciences. And you can see why it's so appealing, because it's almost an anarchic statement uh, about the uh, plurality and diversity of ways of understanding science. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, in relation to, uh, to that, I think the, uh, we are now aware, especially after the COVID uh, uh, experience, that science doesn't speak with one voice. But we still have to learn that knowledge doesn't speak only the language of science. So, uh, uh, I borrowed the term uh, choreography from a researcher at the University of Edinburgh, this idea of uh, choreography. So, it's not about uh, <laughs> an orchestration of scientific disciplines, but it is about uh, a choreography of knowledge forms. Okay? And I think this is a concept that still uh, uh, has to uh, be understood and uh, uh, make operational. So it's, not, it's good to have interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary, whatever you want. But we have to go towards transdisciplinary, and, and or, or already uh, Joan mentioned it, so I talk about choreography. Now, uh, the next episode is uh, uh, in uh, Wai Island, 1990, after, which is the first we can call business meeting of the Society of Ecological Economics, okay? Now, uh, um, yes, uh, that was a group picture. You can see uh, uh, me and, and Joanne here, and I have to say that we all, you should agree that we look much better now than then. <laughs> and, uh, but I also highlighted two people here because they are the two pillars, I would say, of the three pillars of ecological economics here. Uh, Kenneth Boulding and Herman Daly. Uh, and uh, you could see uh, Herman Daly, and we can say, I won't go into details, but uh, it's the economy of care. Let me put it that way. You have to synthesize. And uh, Kenneth Boulding, who is the, who coined this idea of spaceship Earth. And, uh, well, this week, Nature had an article on planetary boundaries, okay? So planetary boundaries goes exactly towards that direction. So Herman and, and, and Kenneth are, were not only relevant then, but they are very relevant today in the discussions of today about an economy of care, an economy that is respectful of planetary boundaries. Uh, a third pillar of ecological economics uh, uh, was not in, at the World Bank Conference in Washington in 1990, and it is uh, Georgescu Reagan, Nicolas Georgescu Reagan. I, I, but this is a picture of us in 1992, a meeting organized by Naredo in Madrid, and uh, uh, talking about precisely the influence of uh, uh, Georgescu Reagan. And, and this is a book I recommend which is a collection by uh, Koso Mayumi and John Gaudi on the bioeconomy and the work of, uh, where there are, of course, our contributions to it. So we had the three, the three pillars of, uh, of ecological economics. And as I said before, with, uh, with Herman and Kenneth, also Georgescu is very relevant today. And Georgescu enables Joan to repeat ad nauseum, the economy is not circular. Now, uh, one person that was at the conference, a keynote speaker, uh, and it is in the picture, but I didn't want to highlight him, uh, is, uh, 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 wrote, uh, wrote a very influential nonsense called The Tragedy of the Commons. And I think, I believe that Joan's environmentalism poor is a fitting answer and reply to, uh, to uh, her uh, Gareth Harding's ideas. Now, uh, in here, you say our contribution 
uh, to the, uh, the book of the conference. And substantially, I won't go into details, but what's the main idea? The main idea is that uh, the science that will help us to face the challenges of the time is qualitatively different to the size, science that contributed to create the mess in which we are in. And there is where the first time in English appears the name of post-normal science, and uh, very fast, and uh, Joan mentioned it, uh, we have here what we call uh, the main insights of post-normal science. One is the mantra. The mantra of post-normal science are the four conditions, the post-normal condition. And it is that facts are uncertain, that there are a, a plurality of values that are in conflict, that stakes are high or potentially high, and decisions are urgent. There are ways of reading it, but these are what we call the post-normal, and everybody experienced that during the COVID pandemic, let's say. That was clear together with the idea that science doesn't speak with one voice. And this is a diagram that tries to address the problem is who judges quality? Who judges the quality of knowledge inputs to uh, policy decision making and, and political action? And uh, I won't go into details, but uh, that would be the idea. Now, uh, but what can I say that the, uh, uh, the post-normal conditions are not only present in pandemics, as in the COVID. Other very important challenges of today have those post-normal conditions. Climate change, ecosystems collapse, biodiversity loss, and all this talk about uh, sustainability transitions. They are all uncertain about the facts. They are value conflicts and plurality of values about what do they mean. They are potentially of very high stakes, as everybody reads every day. And also, we must take decisions because, you know, the time until those decisions are implemented, uh, uh, well, I, 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 no decisions is also a decision. But what is important of this is that these post-normal conditions are not in isolation of a context. These are context-dependent. Okay? And what is this context? This context is one in which we have intolerable inequalities and injustices. We have weak democratic arrangements. We have dangerous authoritarian temptations. And we have a magical idea about the role of technoscience in society. Okay? Now, these are the contexts in which these post-normal conditions operate and in which we have to act with knowledge inputs. Okay? And uh, our way of describing uh, this or this diagram, which I won't go into, is operationalized through what we call extended peer communities, which Joan already mentioned, and uh, the atlas is an example of those case studies related to extended peer communities. And uh, Joan uh, uh, introducing the introducing the. The atlas here in a paper mentions this already, no? How the cases of the atlas exemplify, illustrate how these uh, extended peer communities operate. This is, as he mentioned uh, before, is, well, I had an <laughs> uh, before I, uh, of his chapter uh, of the new book that he mentioned already, and uh, where he develops it more. Now, uh, I'm happy that here we talked about extended peer communities also, and the idea how they relate to environmental conflicts and health uh, conflicts, and how those cases that uh, uh, people talking after me will exemplify somehow are 
are just a way in which uh, uh, how those processes are executed or applied in practice on the territory by real people, not by intellectual. Now, uh, thanks you to, uh, to Joan. Uh, Joan introduced me to someone who collaborated in, the, in this effort, Lucrecia Wagner, who is an Argentinian researcher, in which we are trying to work and put some ideas and illustrate about this uh, extended peer communities in action. And uh, we have kind of, through these interactions, we have a, a, a working definition about these extended peer communities. And it is about spaces where perspective, value, style of knowledge, and power differentials are expressed in a context of inequalities and conflict. Resolution compromise and knowledge compromise are contingent and not necessarily uh, achievable. Are important. It's not that everything will be okay. Perhaps yes, hopefully yes, but not necessarily so. And this is a, the old problem about what is our role in it and how do we have to contribute to, contribute to make this possible and achievable. Now, uh, my last slide is to show how I, I understand with hindsight Joan. Joan is a person with a mission. I mean, it took me a while to understand that, okay? But, uh, uh, and uh, the mission, we would say, started with this ecological economics. It goes through environmentalism of the poor. It goes into political ecology and environmental uh, uh, justice. And uh, we can say that this, today, eh, this week, the Holberg Award, and today, Joanne's birthday also, eh, when new generations of people join us in a struggle for a new world, a new world which has some Principles, some of them are inclusion, diversity, pluralism, care, and justice. So, uh, Joan, uh, mission accomplished. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Silvio. Uh, the next speaker in the symposium is Ksenia Hanacek. She is a political ecologist with a wide range of interests. Hanacek holds a master's degree in environment, agriculture and resource management from the University of Zagreb in Croatia. She also has a second master's degree in interdisciplinary study in environmental, economic, and social sustainability from ICTA UAB. And she also holds a PhD degree from 2019 on a thesis which critically examines cultural ecosystem services. Currently, she's a Margarita Salas postdoctoral fellow at Global Development Studies, University of Helsinki, and at Global Atlas of Environmental Justice at ICTA UIB. Her research focuses on environmental conflicts due to extractivist and mega infrastructure projects in the Arctic region, a theme that should be pretty relevant for Norwegians in the room and those following elsewhere. More specifically, her current research explores such issues as commodity frontiers, climate coloniality, and the Belt and Road Initiative expansion to the Arctic, this latter development often being called the Polar Silk Road. Following this type of research has also led her to look at nuclear supply chains and environmental justice struggles in Soviet and post-Soviet spaces, as well as coal extraction conflicts in southwestern Siberia. 
More theoretically, she studies environmental conflicts through different focuses, such as extractivism, peripherialization, and colonialism in the polar region and beyond. Her work has been published in international scientific journals, such as Global Environmental Change and Ecological Economics. The title of our presentation today is Environmental Conflicts Along the Polar Silk Road. Ksenia Hanacek, the floor and microphone is also yours. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. So in the last almost four years, I have been working on environmental conflicts in the Arctic region. And uh, with this presentation, I would like to share uh, what has been found and what are these implications for environmental justice in the Arctic region. I structured um, the presentation in two parts. In first part, we are going to see a, uh, 50, an analysis of 53 uh, conflicts uh, around the Arctic region. And the focus is on social struggles uh, in the context of a global economy and also bio uh, biophysical transformation of the environment and also uh, human geographies of resource extraction, such as land degradation, cultural, tradition loss, and also marginalization of local communities. But it is important to notice that um, we don't see uh, those spaces only as spaces of marginalization, but uh, importantly, as uh, spaces of resistance. The second part, then, uh, I will focus on environmental conflicts related to a large-scale infrastructure, um, especially in the um, uh, Russian Far East uh, part of the Arctic. And um, uh, this uh, study contributes to political ecology of development corridors and calls for the need to address social environmental transformation and inequality in the region. Both par part one and part two uh, are based on mixed methods of descriptive statistics and regression analysis and also uh, network analysis. So my primary data source is EJ Atlas, uh, which is a very useful uh, data source uh, for uh, analysis of regional and global statistical political ecology analysis, which are related to social environmental problems uh, such as land defense, violence towards women environmental defenders, successful mobilization strategies against extractivism, and uh, also working class communities and toxic pollution in environmental health conflicts. So, before starting with the Arctic, so the big question is why the Arctic? So, um, it ha the region is often perceived as empty polar space, uh, something above 60 degrees north. Uh, however, Arctic region is home to Arctic peoples, uh, such as uh, indigenous Sami, Inuit, Nenets, and other indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. It's also a colonized territory, which served to supply the extractive fossil fuels, <clears throat> metal mining, energy, forestry economies of the richest countries in the world, including Norway, Finland, Russia, and the United States. It is also ground zero for climate change, and it's uh, warming four times faster than other regions in the world. And even so, what we uh, observe is an increase in extraction, global trade, and environmental conflicts. So, with the analysis of the 53 conflicts, what we found was that the geography of those conflicts overlaps with predominantly indigenous people's territories, and the conflicts are character characterized by visible mobilization, such as street protests, but we also found high-intensity intensi conflicts in which repressive actions uh, and violence against people protesting has taken place, such as arrest, uh, violent targeting of activists. And we can see that um, here, the larger the circle, the more intense conflict is in the Arctic. 
<clears throat> we also found uh, a huge variety of conflicts according to a specific economic sector and commodities extracted. And these include oil and gas uh, extraction, but also dam and water distribution conflicts, uh, uranium extraction, port and airports, and uh, um, climate change related conflicts, which are uh, often uh, found in the Arctic region. And then uh, if we look at the uh, uh, commodities, here, of course, copper, gold, diamonds, uranium, nickel, cobalt. Uh, so it's a huge variety of um, different commodities that have been extracted from the Arctic. So uh, when looking at the space of resistance uh, across the Arctic region, we found a transversal network of social groups on the front line uh, against extractivism and that call for environmental and social justice in the region. Uh, and they include local environmental um, justice organizations, indigenous groups, uh, and also neighbors and citizens uh, communities. Uh, however, we find um, um, a lower degree of scientists involved in those conflicts and also lo local government and political parties. So here is the network analysis of the uh, social movement uh, across the Arctic and how different actors and social groups are uh, relating um, and uh, they form a social move movement as a core element um, in defending the Arctic territories. So uh, just uh, shortly on uh, forms of mobilization, uh, besides uh, um, street protest, uh, there is um, um, uh, uh, media-based activism um, uh, regarding the conflicts in the Arctic region and also uh, development of this um, network or collective action that was conferred also uh, by network analysis. So then we looked more deeply into uh, variables of EJ Atlas, which are uh, repression, social environmental consequences at stake, and uh, project, project cancellation. So these are all EJ Atlas variables that we work with. And we found that uh, repression against activists is sig significantly more likely to occur in absence of preventive um, mobilization, so before uh, the official start of the project, and in Arctic countries with a low rule of law. Um, loss of traditional knowledge and practices being significantly higher in indigenous territories of high biocultural values. And the chances to achieve the cancellation of an extractive project um, is significantly higher if dependency on natural resources rents in a country is low. So, for example, if a commodity such as oil is involved in one of the conflicts or um, the sample of the conflicts we are analyzing, um, it's less likely uh, to be cancelled, the project. So, this is what we found within the analysis. And uh, now I'm moving to part two, uh, uh, and I will be focusing on big infrastructure that has been taking place uh, together with the development of the Polar Silk Road. So we are here. So I focus on environmental conflicts in the Russian uh, Far East. So let me just start with the Northern Sea Route before going into a Polar Silk Road. It's um, uh, North, the, the Northern Sea Route is a transportation route, you can see it in blue here. <clears throat> it stretches along the northern coast of uh, Russia across the seas of the Arctic Ocean. And the distance between Northwest uh, European ports and the Far East is reduced by uh, the Northern Sea Route um, by 40%. And it takes about 18 days instead of 32, which is very important for, for the business, they say. Uh, it's also an alt alternative route to the Southern Suez Canal, which is here, uh, marked in red. So then the Polar Silk Road is expansion of regional economic partnership through investment and big infrastructure, and also, of course, uh, related extractive industries um, uh, along the road here. 
uh, of course, for transportation of oil, liquefied natural gas, and also minerals from the Arctic. And the Belt and Road Initiative expansion to the Arctic region is built particularly on the maritime um, promotion of maritime of operations uh, uh, along the, the, the road. So this is how it looks like. And um, uh, we are seeing tankers and nuclear-powered icebreakers that are uh, helping, uh, let's say, helping assisting with, uh, with the development of uh, the Polar Silk Road. And of course, which is ex uh, more access accessible from July to September when sea ice reaches its minimum. So about two-thirds of Russian gas and more than half of uh, Russian oil has already gone to Europe. With the, uh, the war in Ukraine, however, Russia has turned east to China, Turkey and I India in red here. Uh, um, this is the data for uh, October 2022, and I borrowed it for, uh, from the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air to see the patterns of uh, extraction and trade um, on the, along the Polar Silk Road. So um, I found um, there is an increase of number of tankers and also uh, journeys um, um, along the Polar Silk Road, especially for September um, from 2016 and 2019, here and here. And we also see uh, an increase in gross register tonnage and uh, of commodities also for September 2016 until 2019, so there is an increase. And then, uh, from the EJ Atlas, we looked at um, those conflicts in the second part of the presentation that, are, that we found the evidence that are closely related to extraction, but also development of infrastructure, including uh, ports and um, airports, as we will see. I will go a little bit in more detail now uh, about these uh, conflicts, but these are um, nuclear um, power, uh, floating nuclear power plants um, uh, on the Arctic, along the Pol uh, Polar Silk Road. We have Vostok Mega oil project, and of course Yamal, which is also related to Gidan, um, development of um, liquefied uh, natural gas. Uh, and it's in its uh, full swing. So yeah, Yamal, uh, I wanted to highlight um, the additional infrastructure and the companies involved so that we can see the patterns going to east, to east and west uh, from the Arctic region, the, the extraction of the commodities along the Polar Silk Road. And uh, we have, of course, Russian companies and also uh, companies based in China, and also European companies involved in both Gidan and Yamal, which is Total Energies. And we have uh, additional infrastructure such as uh, Sebeta Seaport, International Airport, uh, ICE class uh, carriers that enable year-round navigation, which was different from the first ones that I showed that was uh, that it's possible uh, only tr from um, uh, September, when the um, ice uh, of the Arctic Ocean reaches its minimum. So this is what has been, what has been developing as well. And uh, yeah, uh, for Gidan uh, mega project, we also have LNG tankers that seal east and west, uh, two reloading facilities, one on Kola Peninsula, uh, for the European shipping and also Kamchatka for the e e uh, Asian market. All right. <clears throat> so, Vostok, Vostok um, mega massive oil project, it exceeds also the dimension, the Arctic Circle here. Um, we have uh, um, involved as well here um, Russian companies and also in, uh, Indian companies and a Hong Kong-based company. Uh, wind power plants have been um, also have been um, 
uh, involved in this infrastructure with which the oil will be extracted. It's under construction, but it's uh, very uh, big and massive, and it has al already brought huge environmental and social consequences without operating, let's say. It's $111 billion dollars. Uh, of investment and in additional infrastructure what I am focusing um, in the analysis are 15 towns of port, two airports, 800 uh, kilometers along pipeline, nuclear powered icebreakers, highways, uh, 6,500 wells and um, uh, one of the largest oil transshipment uh, terminal on the Northern Sea route which is Dixon here. <clears throat> and uh, regarding the floating uh, nuclear uh, power plants, it's um, uh, found in uh, Chuk Chukotka Pen Peninsula and that will serve uh, copper and gold mining in the area. Um, nearby is the uh, town of Pevek, where Rosatom already has an uh, academic Lomosov floating, large-scale floating uh, nuclear power plant. And uh, we have also um, uh, Chinese companies um, investing in the projects and uh, also a company from South Korea. And more than 30 million tons of seabed masses were removed uh, for big scale shipping purposes in the area. So looking at all, at all these uh, conflicts and um, the analysis show that there is uh, impact and loss of livelihoods uh, for the Arctic indigenous and non-indigenous peoples, and such as fishing, hunting, re reindeer herding and migration, food security, uh, human nature relationship that people also uh, protect, uh, and uh, including uh, climate change um, uh, problems in the Arctic region. Um, we argue for historical colonial relations since the 16th centuries, century onwards, including the Soviet states period of heavy extraction and industrialization of the Arctic region. These historical and ongoing processes of colonialism are inseparable from extractivist infrastru infrastructure, as we, as we saw, at the expense uh, of local communities such as indigenous, peasants, working class and also women in the Arctic region. It's an internally sustained colonialism which brings along these investments, uh, foreigner and national, uh, for realization of such mega infrastructure uh, project and also uh, global trade. However, we argue that these uh, projects operate on thin ice, meaning that they are very conflictive, and as their social environmental impacts are far-reaching, resistances against these projects are mounting. Uh, Bottom-up preventive and peaceful struggles tend to defend and preserve environmental and social cultural well-being, calling for environmental sustainability, equity, but also social justice. Resistances uh, at the extractive frontier as the Arctic arise globally uh, to protect land, traditional economies and ways of life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ksenia Hanacek, for that presentation. And before we take a break, because there will be a break, we will have one last presenter, and that is Brototti Roy. Brototti Roy is a postdoctoral researcher based jointly at the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology, Autonomous University of Barcelona, ICTA UAB, and the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policy, Central European University in Vienna. She has a bachelor's and master's degree in economics from India. Her master's thesis focused on environmental justice movements against shrimp aquaculture. As she has pointed out, it was in this work that she first discovered the Environmental Justice Atlas, which I know we will hear more about, which we have already heard about, and which I think we will also discuss a bit later on. She also discovered then, during that work, the um, uh, scholarship of Holberg Prize laureate Juan Martinez Aliers. Uh, yeah, his work. 
Dr. Roy is a political ecologist and ecological economist with a PhD from ICTA UAB. Her PhD thesis focused on the political ecology and ecological economy of coal with a focus on India. As both Dr. Funtovich and Dr. Hanacek, also Dr. Roy, has worked in several institutional settings and she has, for instance, previously been a guest researcher at the Pufendorf Institute of Advanced Studies at Lund University, Sweden, working on energy justice. She has also been a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Development Policy at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. Dr. Roy characterizes herself as being interested in action research on environmental and climate justice, as well as degrowth and decoloniality. She is an elected member of the International Society of Ecological Economics and co-president of the Barcelona-based Think and Act Tank, not Think Tank, Research and Degrowth International. She is also a contributing editor of the aptly named journal Uneven Earth, an online journal on political ecology. Her research and activism interest revolves around the co-production of knowledge for socio-ecological justice and equity with a focus on perspectives from the majority world. Dr. Roy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's, it's really a, a privilege and an honor to be here and to share this space with, with all the symposiasts. And since Silvio spoke about so many nice anecdotes while talking about the presentation, I also thought I'll take the first couple of minutes to, to talk about my introduction to, to ecological economics and political ecology. I had no idea about this field of ecological economics. I was doing very mainstream economics, bachelor's of science and master's of science degrees. And in one of the elective courses that I, that I somehow took, there was a former student of Joanne called Julian Francois Gerber, who was giving this course on key principles of ecological economics. And I thought, this sounds interesting. This is not something that I've heard of before. Let's see what is this new way of doing, doing research. <clears throat> And uh, Julian Francois had this very interesting way of dividing <clears throat> the classes into smaller groups, and each group had to pick up one article and discuss this, basically summarize it. And there was this one article called The Worth of a Songbird. And I was like, this sounds very interesting. I will pick up this article. This was one of the articles, earlier ones, uh, talking about post verbal science written by Silvio and Ravitz. And, uh, and it's interesting, like less than 10 years from then, I'm now standing here sharing a space with the two of you talking about ecological economics, political ecology, and the environmental justice atlas. So it's really an honor and a privilege. What I'm going to talk about today is a little bit on looking at the ways in which when we talk about the global movement of environmental justice, what are the issues or what are the challenges that we are facing from the other side? So I'm not going to focus on environmental justice conflicts, but I'm going to focus on the ways in which claims for justice are being used by people who are not, in our opinion, that serious about doing real action for, for in some way, reducing the climate crisis that we are in. Uh, the idea of this, this research is, is a collaborative research. When I was in, in Pufendorf, right after finishing my thesis, working on uh, energy justice. We came together with other people who have also been working on, on climate justice, environmental justice, energy justice, and this, this idea that now in academia, in civil society, more or less we know that nobody is denying the climate crisis that evidently, yet enough action is not being taken. So what are the reasons why enough action is not being taken? What are the what are the different motivations or what are the different narratives which are being said for this idea of, or this discourse of climate delayism. And there is, there is a paper written by William Lamb and colleague, which I'll show in a bit, this big, uh, this big graph with four different 
subcategories looking at what are the different ways in which climate action is being delayed and what are the claims, often justice claims, often claims of uh, inequality, which are used to stop or which are used to prevent or slow down a socio-ecological just transition. Uh, so, so these are the people with whom we worked at Lund uh, a couple of years ago. And if some of you remember, or if some of you follow the, the COP processes in, in COP26, in Glasgow, there was this idea of, uh, of talking about uh, a coal phase out. And in the very last day of the climate negotiations, they said it's not going to be phase out, it's going to be phase down. And I think that was when we were all together and trying to think, is this only happening in some parts? Some of us were more aware about certain geographical locations than the other. And all of us wanted to start exploring, let's see what are the different narratives or what are the different ways in which this phase out becomes phase down. Or, or yes, we want to go for a renewable energy transition, but only in 2045. Whereas the science shows that it's really going to be too late if, if that is how long the, the timeline you're going to think of. And the reason why you're thinking of that is looking at uh, techno-optimist solutions. So the, the three main research questions of this, of this investigation was basically looking at uh, different countries. So we looked at Germany, India, Mexico, Serbia, and South Africa. And all these countries have different percentages of coal in their energy mix. We've only wanted to focus on coal and not on fossil fuels in general. And, uh, and the idea was despite the differences in energy mix, despite each country's being either net exporter or net importer, what were the motivations and if there was some way in which we could find some connections and if we could propose or start this dialogue with this framework of, uh, of climate de uh, delayism. And uh, finally, what would, would then be the implications of these findings? And to do that, this was mostly a, mostly a literature review and uh, looking at different, or looking at our previous experiences working in these regions. And the idea was to look at the debates around, uh, around what are the steps needed for going towards a just transition. To give you one small example, we, follow, we found close to 90 claims looking at all these, uh, all these six countries. Uh, I will only focus on India uh, for this conference, and then I will discuss a little bit about how do they relate to the other context, and then what could be the possible addition in this, in this framework of climate delayism. So to look at one such, one such data sheet that we had to see, <coughs> we started with what is the main argument, and we had one data sheet for one argument, which is the country, where this argument comes from, what is the scale of, the, of, of this narrative? So it, is it being spoken at the local level? Is it being spoken at the national level? Is it more specific to particular states or particular region? Then who are the institutions and actors who are talking about this? And, and then what are the documents that we found for this? And finally, and I think this was the more interesting part, whether this claim makes sense or not, whether there is any truth to this claim or not. And, uh, and we spoke about uh, post-normal science before, but there are some people who are now saying the, the world that we're living in today is the world of post-truth politics. And let me give you a small example of post-truth politics, which is something which we found a lot in our, in our research, uh, that there was this call from India to privatize coal mines, uh, and the reason for why we need to privatize coal mines and open up more mines, auctioning of private coal mines, was because it's going to create tons of jobs and it's going to bring in so much, uh, so much economic profit. And there is a special provisioning called Right to Information Act in India uh, with which anybody can ask any public office where their data or where their findings are coming from. And one environmental journalist did just that. And the response from the, from the Prime Minister's office was, we actually don't have any document to support this claim which was made by the office. This was a mistake. 
you generally do not have such outright answers saying we don't have data. But the truth is, if you do a little bit more digging, it is often hard to find data for saying you're going to create 10,000 of lakhs of jobs and, and so much more economic benefits. So this was, the, this was then trying to understand whether the concerns that a climate justice transition is going to take a while is actually true or whether it's only in favor of certain people with vested interests. So to quickly show you what is the, what is the, the framework that I'm talking about. <clears throat> so the framework is called the Discourses of Climate Delay and you can see there are four main subcategories of it. Uh, the first one is, is this idea of redirecting responsibilities. I think, I think you can more or less read, no? Yeah. Uh, this idea of redirecting responsibilities, the idea of pushing for non-transformative non solutions, the idea of emphasizing on the downsides. So the example that I gave before would be what will happen to jobs, what will happen to economic benefits. And, and the final is it's too late anyway. We just have to change is completely impossible, we cannot do anything at this moment. So these were the four main discourses of, uh, of uh, climate delayism. And during our, doing our research and trying to do the comparisons with different studies, we thought of uh, three other key points that we can add into this and make it more full, because also this, this uh, paper was this paper was written mostly taking into consideration people from the minority world, people from the global north. And if you start looking at cases from the other parts of the world, there are also these ideas which are very interestingly being used of uh, global inequality and climate debt. Uh, and it's very interesting uh, to see how these narratives which came from environmental justice movements, uh, climate debt, ecological debt, somehow are now used by big corporations and big governments were saying, no, we need to still continue coal because the world owes us more coal. And that's also one of the narratives to delay, delay any kind of uh, strong climate action. So now to quickly go back to the key findings from India. Hmm. So not surprisingly, the, the main reason for, for why we still need to continue with more focus on fossil fuels, particularly on coal, is because, because of our development needs. We have a large population, there is a lot of energy insecurity, uh, not everybody has access to even basic energy, basic household energy facilities throughout the day. And also what about all the jobs which we have, what about all the economic development, economic growth which will not come if we do not use a if we somehow suddenly stop using coal. Uh, these, I worked during my PhD on a paper with a colleague called Anke Shafarsik, uh, a paper titled Talk Renewable, Walk Coal, in which we debunked these, the, these, first three, uh, these first three narratives for why coal is needed, in which we showed that while coal production, coal generation keeps on increasing, employment either remains stable or goes down, and, uh, and by doing field work, the kind of employment that is even given is not something that if you ask people if they want it, they would, they would say that yeah, this is what they're looking for. Uh, similarly, the case with uh, revenue generation. So it's interesting to see while there are research out there showing that this is a lie, these are the lies which still keep on getting percolated. The more interesting point was commitment to uphold decision, which was basically saying that in certain states, in certain regions, uh, coal mining leases have already been given, or the initial social, social impact assessment and environmental impact assessments of certain thermal power plants uh, or construction of ports to bring in more coal has already been given out. And now, if we suddenly stop those just because, just because we have this, uh, this target to transition, which is not happening, 
then what about the society at large? What about the laws and the rules and the agreements that hold us together? We cannot simply move away with that. So that, so that is a very interesting, interesting way of explaining why in the future we would not have anything else. But right now, already in the pipelines, we have so many coal mines and so many summer power plants coming up for the next 15 years, so we cannot stop that. And this, this we realized, is also not something only in India, but you also see this idea of, which we call in the paper, rule of law, also in Germany. And finally, this idea of technological optimism, I think we discussed it already a little bit, this idea of clean coal technologies, or that we'll make it more efficient and less polluting. And this is also present throughout, uh, throughout all the countries that we looked at. One thing which was a little bit different from other countries was this, this push for privatization. So looking at the cases of, uh, of Serbia and South Africa, Mexico, you still, have a, you still have more, let's say, more emphasis on the, the national coal, coal being a national asset, but now in India there is suddenly this idea of unleashing coal or making it more, getting in more uh, shareholders' values for coal, and this was something unique to India. So looking at these different key findings and comparing them with the other ones, let's now go back to the, to, to the uh, circle. So we said, or we thought of three new subcategories which can fall into the categories that we already have. In the category of, uh, of emphasizing the, the downsides, which is the last one in the, in the blue, we thought an interesting one would be to add the idea of the rule of law, which says that if, if you do not follow what has already been agreed on, this means that we don't follow social contracts, and this means we cannot think of, uh, think of continuing forward when we just stop all the projects look at what, are the, what harm it will cause with all the contracts that the country has with these different projects. And, uh, and the other two, which would go in the redirecting responsibility, which is the one on the top, would be one, global inequality, like how we still, if we look at historic terms, how we still have uh, emitted such less carbon dioxide emissions, there is so much global inequality, how can you expect us? And this comes more from the majority world, more from the global south countries. Uh, how can you expect us to now suddenly cut down on, on the emissions? And how can you suddenly expect us to move away from fossil fuel? And climate debt, which is that the world owes us some more carbon budget, some more carbon benefits before we can go ahead. So I think that is it. That is all I wanted to say in this presentation. Thank you so much for your patience and listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Brototti Roy. Uh, this concludes the first part of this, um, of this uh, symposium. Uh, we will now have a break for 30 minutes. I'm not sure how long 30 minutes is because I can't see the clock. Uh, so if you could get that up. So we meet again here at 10.50, um, 10.50, yes? So welcome back then. And after the break, there will also be a chance to engage the symposiasts on stage. Thank you.
welcome back, everyone. I mean, uh, getting academics in place is like herding cats, but you've all behaved very well. Uh, so this is very good. I'm now happy to open this second part of the symposium, and this will be more open-ended. It will be based on and um, on the presentations we've already heard and around the theme that has been introduced. And we will have a discussion on stage first here between our four symposiasts. And towards the end, we will open for um, questions and interventions from the audience. And I hope everyone is uh, okay with that. And I think it is only proper to give um, the first comment to Professor Juan Martinez Allier to hear if you have any reflections or any responses to the interventions you've heard from mm. Silvio, Kesenia, and Brototti. Okay. So, Juan. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. So, <clears throat> well, in fact, I know what all the participants in this. Uh, Symposium more or less were going to say, although I didn't know about Brototti, actually. Uh, and from day two, from what Senia said and Brototti, I think a very clear theme is oil, gas, and coal. And of course, climate change because of this. So I think that if one listens to politicians or to other people, in Europe, in the European Union, for instance, there is a lot of discussion about how the economy is dematerializing or is going to dematerialize, mm -hmm. how we are going to reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions in 20 years, 30 years, to net zero, and so on. Sometimes I call this kind of language, including sustainable development, which was more or less introduced in this country, by in the Brunland uh, report, and not to speak of the sustainable development goals, including number eight, that preaches further economic growth, isn't it? This I call this litanies. I don't know, in, I, I, I am a lapsed Catholic and a lapsed economist also, <laughs> but lit, las litanias, the litanies, no? like ora pro nobis, creation, uh, and these are these kind of ritual words, sustainable development, net zero dematerialization of the economy, which are so far from reality that is more uh, fiction than facts to, say, to make this very sort of simple distinction. And we saw this because, for instance, one thing that Senia didn't mention because she had no time, that from the top of Siberia in this place, she called, as it's the name, Dixon, Dixon, from Dixon, there is, as we saw, Bharat Petroleum. Bharat means India. India. <coughs> a company, I don't know whether private or public, public still, fine. because yeah. it sounds public, because Bharat is a really uh, old name for India. Uh, Bharat Petroleum was mentioned, but also was not mentioned, but it exists. There is a plan now, a real plan, which is going, coming soon, of export of coal, coal, old-fashioned coal, answer site actually for, for steel making from Dixon to India through the polar eastern road, isn't it? But not to China in that case, to India, which is quite far away, but it's going to go there. It's not that India does not have enough coal, but it's true that India is only at one billion tons of coal per year, and China is at 4 billion tons of coal per year. And one of the uh, discussions that one can have in this uh, discussion about discourses about climate change is that why should India be the first one to reduce you know, when in India per capita is at such a level, but per capita including Modi and including Adani and including some other very rich people. But India per capita is at a level of carbon dioxide emissions, which if everybody was at the same level, there would be no increased climate uh, change mm -hmm. or, or, or greenhouse effect. Because India is at about of one, two tons of, 
of emissions per capita, while the world is at about 10 uh, tons per capita of CO2. Therefore, uh, there are all kinds of issues of inequality, but also issues of how the world economy continues to increase emissions now this year, after the pandemics, we are going back to the happy 20s, like after the Spanish flu epidemics of 1920 or 1918, perhaps. But this happiness is a false happiness because it goes together with these environmental effects. So we could talk more about this, but the false illusions or delusions about biofuels, about uh, fossil fuels, and how the world is going, and what should, could be done about it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the, in the aspect of what could be done about it, it's first to discuss the issues, mm -hmm. and the issues which are post-normal, discuss it in a post-normal framework. We are not sure, there is uncertainty. The issues which are clearer, or become clearer, to discuss them as, as scientific issues that we have more or less knowledge, mm -hmm. and therefore what should be done. But in fact, what happens, I will discuss during the week in other sessions, nothing is being done in practice about climate change. If you look at the killing curve, it's going up, 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 up. When I started in 92, because I already said I was a lapsed economist. Uh, lapsed economist, I said it with some pride, because you can acquire new religions, isn't it, in life. Uh, but uh, when I changed from econ doing economic history to doing more environmental, uh, ecological economics, it was in 92. I taught the first course to, in the environmental sciences group in the university, together with a real ecologist or ecological scientist. And we were at 360 parts per million. And now we are 400. 20 parts per million still, and going up one or two parts per million. So when the young people in the audience are my age, well, I don't want to know how many parts per million there will be, but much more than 460, 470 parts per million. Therefore, nothing is being done, despite all the cops and so on. And this is something, well, in this kind of solemn place, I, this, I think, is not, uh, there is not a lot of uncertainty, of course, things might change, change will have to change, but we know this. Therefore, both from the point of view of the production or the extraction of materials, nickel was mentioned, copper was mentioned in the Arctic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And from the point of view of the pollution, of the waste disposal conflicts, we are going into a bad direction, and this explains the importance of this price to ecological economics and to political ecology, so it means that we, something good is happening. Also, I think what is good that is happening is that population growth, which we are not discussing here, but is stopping growth. <coughs> this, I think, is a good thing. But on the other hand, the hope remains, in my view, on these local movements, as Botot explained, sometimes local movements which have also a world perspective mm -hmm. and which are active everywhere. And sometimes they would try to stop a coal mine, or would start, try to stop, for instance, a coal fire power plants, of which there are more and more around the world, because of local reasons of pollution, isn't it? But all together, one can in a way construct, isn't it, or interpret. It's not real reality, the thing. But one can sort of believe, but it's more than belief. We have empirical evidence of this kind of movements around the world, which are on the side of moving to, in practice, a degrowth economy in, part, in practice, mm. not because they like the word degrowth in India mm. or in South Africa or in Colombia. They don't want to degrow because they, they, are, they haven't grown too much, but in practice they stop pipelines, they stop sometimes uh, coal fire power plants, and so on. And this is a motive for hope, I think. And apart from the hope, from the political hope, is a motive for research. It's a, a topic that should be researched much more. Mm -hmm. I don't know in which discipline. Somebody came to me now, said, I am a social anthropologist. Well, good. 
at least a social anthropologist in theory should know about everything, isn't it? <laughs> and and <laughs> like historians, historians should know about everything. There is no reason why they should not know about anything, everything. <laughs> Since it is difficult for a human being in our lifetime to know about everything, for instance, since I came here, I have expanded my ignorance quite considerably. I didn't know very much about Holberg. Now I've seen <laughs> Holberg, several statues of Holberg, and I, also the music of Holberg. I, I really realized that how beautiful is the Greek uh, suite, isn't it? Uh, to tell the truth, six months ago, I was not aware. So one can expand the ignorance. This is easy to do. But uh, that's why, to come back to the beginning of Silvio's talk, this idea of the orchestration of the sciences, or you called it the, the choreography of the sciences. Knowledges. Yeah, of, of knowledge. Well, a choreography means that everybody is doing something different, but they all together do something uh, together. And an orchestra is like this, given the, the Holberg's uh, suite. I think it's all strings, isn't it? But could be some timbals also. Uh, so you have different instruments playing the same piece, the same music, the same opus. Therefore, this is why why we should do this and not be afraid of bringing the sciences and the knowledges together to understand, to try to understand what is happening modestly and deliberations and discussions and also for actions, so like in this, this uh, body or this uh, whatever it is, the thing you belong to, you are the secretary or the, one of the representatives of, you call it, the Think and Action Think and Act. Network called The Growth in Barcelona, isn't mm -hmm. it? Think <laughs> and Action. Well, it's, if we are university people and thinking people, we are very reluctant about the action, myself also. We are contemplative people, isn't it? The Vita Contemplativa, I think that Anna Arendt talked about this. But we have to, sometimes we have to act, even if we are wrong. But acting not alone, Mm -hmm. not only because alone it's impossible to do anything, but acting with the other people in the other disciplines. And this, they should be like, in, well, there are institutes like this. The ICT in Barcelona is a bit like this. An institute where are people who know oceanography, and you can expand your ignorance every day, asking questions to other people and try to do this. So this, I think, the task of the universities should be this, to not to expel people doing new things like ecological economics because they are not proper economists, or people doing political ecology because the word political is very dangerous, mm -hmm. but on the contrary, to try to bring these people together to interpret what is going on and to try to improve the, the very desperate situation mm -hmm. we are getting into. Joan, thank you for that. And uh, when you mentioned that anthropologists should know all, I got very nervous being an anthropologist. <laughs> and, uh, I think the expansion of ignorance is, yeah. uh, is a much Practice. better term for the kind of humility we should all uh, approach uh, the world with. But I wanted to come back to your, the, the point you ended with on, on, on action and the kind of uh, role of research or science and perhaps also the role of academia in these uh, kind of contexts. And, and I wanted to have a round uh, to get comments from the others uh, on stage as well. Perhaps we could start with uh, Ksenia or yes. Brototti and come back to you, Silvio, on sort of mm -hmm. what is the role of action, you could say, or engagement, mm -hmm. or alignment with different movements, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. being part of a choreography of knowledges, as, uh, as uh, Silvio That's called cool. it, in, in, mm -hmm. in your research. Mm -hmm. I don't know who would like to mm -hmm. start first. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. So, I would say, and this is what we wrote together with Brototti as well in the paper, Ecological Economics and the Growth from the Margins, meaning supporting uh, communities and their struggles on the ground that come from them. And first of all, uh, understanding, as Joan said, the struggle first, no? And then um, um, uh, being supportive uh, from, no, academia as well, but... Mm -hmm. 
uh, in collaboration with, um, with the communities on the ground, I would say. This is very important because also protests around the world have huge consequences um, on the people that put their lives, let's say, on the front line for justice. And um, we have to also approach that very carefully and um, being aware that, especially in some uh, countries uh, around the world, this could have uh, huge consequences. So I would say this is important to understand and to, to support the struggle, but that comes from the peoples themselves. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Prototi? I think for me, since we're also talking about uh, the Environmental Justice Atlas today, maybe I can share some experiences from the Environmental Justice mm -hmm. Atlas in a way in which, while staying within academia, also it is possible to support the struggles which are happening on ground, as Senia says. So, so while, the, while the EG Atlas was a co-creation process, it was created by multiple people, both, both in academia, civil society, activists, who came together and decided this 10-page database on looking at different ways in which uh, ecological distribution conflict or environmental justice movements affects, impacts uh, the people mobilizing. So that kind of gives us this idea of who are the key players, what are the, what are the successful mobilization strategies, what are the impacts and what are the outcomes. And there is there is this feature of the, of the EJ Atlas called the Featured Map, in which the idea is to make visible more how certain movements or how certain injustices done by one particular company globally can shed light to the ways in which different communities are fighting against that and can bring people together. And often we get, uh, let's say, certain invitations or certain requests to, to highlight these injustices. To give an example, again, also a little bit from India, is this big coal mining company called Adani, which has multiple conflict projects in different parts of the world. Uh, so when we, in the EJ Atlas, just pulled Adani, we can see there is one project in Eastern India, there is one project, the, maybe some of you know this famous Carmichael mine in Australia, there is one project in Bangladesh. What are the ways in which this one particular company uses kind of similar strategies in all these different places. And, and is there a way in which we can build solidarities and talk with the movements in different parts of the world and kind of have a more global fight against, uh, against certain injustices? So I think that could be one small way in which we can do engaged research. And the other also is, and maybe then this goes more to Silvio's point, is also to to go beyond disciplines, to go beyond uh, just academia, and to really be aware that knowledge is, a lot of knowledge exists outside the walls of university, and to have real conversations and know that there are power imbalances and how to, how to be open and see, see ways in which you can really co-create something and really fight for socio-ecological injustices. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and, and, and this brings me to, to, to a term that, that is sometimes used, and perhaps Silvio can come in here as well. This is the term of, of community, which I'm very happy that you now, in a sense, made a bit more complex, you know, because the term community can cover all, all manners of sins, in a sense. Yeah? I mean, a community can be constructed by the state, it can be territorialized. Yeah. As an anthropologist, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a template term that, that might be problematic. So I'm very glad you, Prototi, you brought up the, um, the, the issue of, of, you know, power imbalances also mm -hmm. in these local communities, uh, that these are not pristine communities that are readily accepting in, you know, people to engage with them, in a sense. Yeah. But Silvio, would yes, uh, like to comment? Yes, I would like to follow on, on Prototi's point. And, uh, you know, it's not by chance that uh, Joanne is a historian. There was a fashion around the 60s uh, uh, that all the social sciences and history have to become like quantitative like physics. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now one of the people I mentioned, uh, Georgescu Rogan, is not only, but he argued that in reality physics should be more like history. And uh, uh, the point is that uh, uh, at a certain point of time, uh, 
especially in, in Western intellectual tradition, uh, there was a decision to make knowing that be, uh, more important than knowing how. And uh, we have an incredible number of examples to show that most of the challenges humanity had to face were solved by other forms of knowledge and not by science. Mm -hmm. So this has been hidden. And it is a part of what we can call, and we called it, uncomfortable knowledge. So one of the action points is uh, to bring out this uncomfortable knowledge and explain why are the, what are the reasons for this knowledge to be uncomfortable and hidden. <clears throat> OK, so uh, uh, really, uh, I could say that why every time that there is a big crisis, people are surprised. How is mm -hmm. it possible? Mm -hmm. No, we, we are not surprised. Because it's a way, type of deja vu. Crisis like the pandemics, perhaps not. But we had before. And we had every time to learn again these experiences which last enough until we go back to normal. Mm -hmm. Which, in a sense, is not normal at all. But why we consider normal that is just uh, uh, to forget ideas about complexity and uh, ideas about pluralism and inclusion and the need uh, to, uh, uh, to include diversity and all that. Why? And that takes you to the political, to the institutional, and to the constitutional. You know, this passage from knowing that and to a transdisciplinary knowing how, it, it, it requires also the revision of our constitutional arrangements. Okay? So, uh, you know, uh, Gramsci in 1921, writing about uh, Spain and Italy, said that history teaches, but it has no students. Mm. <laughs> uh, 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 well, uh, I would say it has students, but uh, forget. And they are co the conditions, as I say, the structural conditions that put that in, in Orwell's, uh, you know, a hole where the comfort comfortable ideas were thrown and mm. disappeared. Mm. You know, uh, I don't know if I answered the question, but at least it gives you a, 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 a way to understand what is going on and why every time we are surprised about something that happened many times in the past already. Hmm. Yes, Joan, would you like to come? Yeah, I'm just saying that we're going back to normal. Uh, and well, well, when you say this, well, whatever normal is, uh, whether we are really well, can we see, for instance, in this description about the Arctic that we are going to have this master class also on the Arctic, which is a bit presumptuous to come to, from Barcelona to teach about mm -hmm. the Arctic. <laughs> but I try to make this kind of experiments. It's the extension uh, of... Uh, to, to extend my <laughs> ignorance. So I hope to get complaints. More than questions, I like complaints. <laughs> and, but we'll talk about the Arctic in the master class. And we see this, the extension that she has done about the Polar Silk Road. Well, she, I mean, the Chinese state is promoting more, more or less with Russia, in which we have nuclear power mm -hmm. icebreakers mm -hmm. with a caravan of, no, even coal for India, from Dixon, and so on. This is not normal in any story. This is new in the world. Well, it's not like Columbus going to America, but it's also, uh, this history is always, it's not repeated, it changes. And, but in a way, that all these things, there is some rules. And one rule is that when they wrote this article, you two and some other, on the degrowth from the margins, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's called, well, I have even criticized this in writing because they are growing up to cope with criticism in the following sense. 
that what looks the margins, because what more margins than Jadal, Jamal Peninsula, even before the Ukrainian war, most people in Europe, did, they knew about total energies, and they knew about Putin, of course, but they didn't know that they had been together, Patrick Pouyanné from Total, and Putin on the other arm, and Macron on the other arm, the trio, celebrating that the gas from the Amal Peninsula would come to Western Europe, this before the war in the Ukraine, isn't it? So this was in the, in the news. And Greenpeace in Paris also did a demonstration in front of the Total Energies company some 10 years ago already with a melting uh, sort of block of ice to symbolize what was going to happen. So if we see the Arctic and we see Amazonia full of new mining projects or oil extraction, or we see everywhere in the world in what from a European or from New York is in as the margins, these places are not marginal in other sense. They are not marginal because they are the hottest commodity extraction frontiers, mm -hmm. whether it's the Arctic or whether it's Ecuador or Peru for oil or Colombia for, for coal and so on. They look distant from Chicago and from, uh, and from Boston, isn't it? or from New York, or, or from Paris, or from London. But they are the center of the world from a metabolic point of view. <laughs> and from a metabolic point of view, what happens is that once you have extracted, for instance, now half a million barrels of oil uh, per day, like 20 million tons of oil per year, from a little country like Ecuador, well, tomorrow again, and tomorrow again, more or less, up and down a little bit, but the one that you extracted two days ago is already in the refinery, mm -hmm. or in making plastics perhaps, but it is in the refinery about to be distributed and to be burned forever. So this idea of entropy is very real. Or, better said, entropy is a physical law, which of course is very uh, operative in reality. Isn't it? And in the, you, like, the economy is not circular at all. This is another of the, of the litanies that we are moving to a circular economy. In China, they have a law of the circular economy. The European Union continually is enacting directives. It's, well, it's a performative action, hoping that the world will follow the, what is written, isn't it? Um, but the economy is not circular, the economy is entropic, as George S. Corrigan wrote uh, very clearly in his book, The Entropy Law and the Economic Process. The economy meaning the economy based on fossil fuels and the economy based, which of course are photosynthesis from the past and is, they are no longer produced, or which are metals, because there is a lot of new materials in the world and there is a lot of geodiversity in the world, isn't it, apart from biodiversity. Mm -hmm. But if we use them now, they are, cannot be used again, except for a little bit of the aluminium or the copper, which can be recycled at a great cost in energy. So where the marginal, what looks marginal places, which, by the way, are full of people, or at least full of other species, surviving species, like the Nenets and the Inuits and the Gwich, and all these peoples in the Arctic, in, on, and in, the, in both, in, all around the Arctic, with their own proud names, because this is not a thing, this indigenous revival everywhere, including the Samis, I think, in Scandinavia. And why the revival? Why the pride? Well, because they are very old. They have been there for thousands of years, but also because they are subject to new waves of what we could call colonization. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. But colonization driven not just by a few sort of uh, tons of silver or, or pepper like Vasco de Gama or a few tons of gold as poor Columbus could put in the little boats. No, no, now it's much larger. So this is the normal. Mm -hmm. The normal is the increased amount of materials and energy in the economy from the commodity frontiers, which are not very distant or very marginal. They are very central to the world economy mm -hmm. in a way which cannot be normalized, cannot be done again and again and again. 
both because of the pollution and because of the exhaustion. The exhaustion means that there isn't enough oil and coal. There is a lot of coal left in the world. But why has Adani to go to Australia or why he has to go to Chhattisgarh, to Jharkhand, to Adivasi territory, to exploit the life of these people, mm. to deprive them of freedoms, the little freedoms they have. Mm. Development means depriving freedoms, to paraphrase mm -hmm. our very admired Amartya Sen, mm. who got it wrong, saying development should mean freedom, not GDP, but development, economic growth, means poverty and depriving people of land, water, and air as the very good title of my book says. <laughs> <laughs> Brotati, you wanted to comment on this. Yeah, so, so that is why uh, this point about this is not the margin, this is why if you notice today in the presentation I was calling it the majority world and the minority world. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, we should also not forget that this minority world or the center is the one which has disproportionate power, both economic, social, and even soft power. Uh, to give a very, very small example, uh, if I tell somebody, if I ask somebody, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Bokaro, I wonder how many people would know where Bokaro is from, where Bokaro is located. But if somebody says, I'm from New York, or if somebody says, I'm from Paris, uh, these places are well known. So it's important to also keep that in mind, that it's good to shift the conversation, but it's also critical to know these ideas of core and periphery or center and margin are much beyond what we would like to be understood as center and margin. So we do little shifts talking about majority and minority world, but the truth is, the reality is like that. Thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to come back to, to this environment justice atlas and the kind of work you do there I mean because this relates to all of what you've been saying I mean one point about decentering is always recentering so there is work going on at the how should I say the discursive level yeah to recenter the world or to to produce new perspectives on the world yeah like uh, uh, Ksenia also did in her presentation of shifting our focus to the Arctic. And then there is the point that Joanna has come up with a few times about the material reality, the material flows and its importance for the economy. But there is also this aspect that you've uh, all alluded to but you haven't really uh, talked too much about and that is the work of translation in a sense that necessarily goes into the environmental justice atlas from the local epistemologies or ways of seeing the world into um, these typologies, in a sense, in the environmental justice atlas. And that necessarily has to come with some, how should I say, challenges, both politically and to, in terms of translation, etc. So would anyone like to comment on that, on that type of, 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 of feeding local distinct worlds into typologies, in a sense? If you want to talk about no. the Atlas, go ahead. Uh, you, you, me, whatever. <laughs> anyway. I will say something very brief <laughs> okay. of this because in the Atlas, of course, it's written. There is, a, as he said, a 10 page or 6 page or 8 page uh, data sheet. Um, uh, sheet. And then uh, with a description, and then it says description of the project because. Many of the conflicts arise from new investment projects or could be policies by the government. And then there is some coded variables that you can have to do the statistics and so on. So there is plenty of room in the, in the data sheet to, to put words, descriptions. And then at the ask, we ask, is this a success in environmental justice? Or you don't know? Or there is three options, no, don't know, yes or no, which is in itself can be discussed what it means and so on. So one thing arose at the beginning of the others that people from Latin America refused to fill in the, 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 base, the sheets in English. And they said, we're going to do in Spanish. Is, is an, I said, well, this is another colonial language. Mm. Uh, I am <laughs> Catalan myself. So, uh, but this was not the point. The point is that for them, writing in English means writing gringo English, isn't it? <laughs> and therefore they refused and said, doesn't matter. And little by little we thought that we could translate everything with Google and with write and with Chinese and Arabic and so on. We made a big 
mess of the thing because Google is not yet, or whoever comes after Google, uh, is not good enough to translate the subtleties mm -hmm. of these mm -hmm. quizzes and things. So that's one point we have. Mm -hmm. Because if we want to make it open to everybody, everybody should be able to access. And also we are discussing all the time whether people with phones, because most people, in, many people in the world have phones, isn't it? Where they can see the others in the phone with the description and so on. And there is a place for them to comment against everything that we have said. But to tell the truth, it's not very interactive as it could be or should be. Mm -hmm. Because we get some complaints from firms sometimes or from photographers that say, Reuters is very fond of writing, saying you have to pay $200 because of a photo that you put in the others, which is another kind of issue. <laughs> but so far, we have not had attacks from companies or from governments, which I'm surprised, but because we are really ineffective in, in politics, I suppose. <laughs> and because, yeah, there is this thing called slaps, you know, strategic, Litigation against public participation mm -hmm. is an arm that they must teach this in business school, I suppose. First course, how to do a good slap against lawyers and people like this. Mm -hmm. So we have not been this kind of attacks. Well, these are some anecdotes about the others. Mm -hmm. We could have many other. Mm -hmm. Your question was deeper and to say mm -hmm. how much co-production there is and it, mm -hmm. for instance, with China, we have cases, we have less cases that we should have uh, compared to the population and the conflicts that there are and the four billion tons of coal. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there, must, there are many. Health, for instance, there is a pandemic or an epidemic or many cases of pneumoconiosis, no? pneumoconiosis, which is called black lung in British, uh, in, in British language from the type of the mining uh, industry, black lung. This is more or less like hidden, but exists, and there are, we have cases in the others. In fact, an article published by Joan Leo on pneumoconiosis based on cases in the others. Mm -hmm. But it's not easy, even in my view, even for Chinese anthropologists, for instance, to go to these places and ask the people, well, it's even more difficult in Honduras or Guatemala or Filipinas. Mm -hmm. You risk your life. In fact, we had, uh, well, anyway, it's, it's dangerous for human life to be too inquisitive, depending, many journalists are killed around the world, isn't it? <coughs> Not only war situations, but because some people is angry about what they are writing. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we are working at a distance, and every case in the others is documented with a blog, at least with a blog entry, or with a newspaper, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. translated if needed, mm -hmm. or with a photo of a demonstration. So in fact, inside the others, it is forbidden to do research, original research in practice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we are afraid that it would be very dangerous, not in, we do it in Norway, mm -hmm. but it could be very dangerous mm -hmm. in other places. So that's some of the rules of the others. But I think your question was deeper than this. It was, it was a bit deeper. But Silvio, a brief uh, uh, yes, comment from you. I and just then, want to go then, back to the... And then afterwards, we'll yeah, open the floor okay, for the audience. Okay, sorry. Okay. I'll try. Uh, I want to go back about well, my perspective on, on the importance of the atlas. And also uh, about how it relates to action, participation, engagement, and action. Well, I think the importance is that it sh makes visible these hundred thousands and uh, only because of time and, and resources that uh, because you perhaps they more. are, we don't know how many they are. Mm -hmm. But also it shows the diversity, mm -hmm. the diversity of uh, those forms of action and resistance and struggle. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is important because uh, I think we came to a stage where uh, we have, we shouldn't talk about world movement, but world movements. Mm. Appreciating and respecting the diversity mm -hmm. of their forms of action. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you see, we are coming, or we have finished, this idea of control prediction and rational management. Yeah. You, you know. And so, uh, we have to the new normal 
is experimentation. Mm -hmm. And experimentation has to do with coming to terms with errors, with mistakes mm -hmm. of all kinds of form. And so we like the smallest beautiful, these thousands of ways of trying to you know, act in a painful and dangerous situation. And as say in Italian, you know, if there are roses, they will flower. Okay? And the question then, just to finish, my, is to how do we make mistakes and experiment without losing legitimacy and credibility? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem of uh, uh, moral and political philosophy and action. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. As promised, we now open the floor to the uh, audience. We have my two lovely colleagues, one on each side with a microphone. So if you're interested in posing a question or would like to respond to anything that has been said, please raise your hand. And when you post your question, state your name and be brief and say who you would like to post it to. Hi, uh, Alice Aysel from the Geography Department. Uh, development is often dispossession with, for many people and then deprivement of deprivement from freedoms, as you said. But in the current political environment, how would you explain many people are now voting for the politicians who develop their countries based on extractive economies. So how would you explain that apparent dilemma in voting? Thank you for that. Uh, the paradox of voting patterns for yeah, faster extraction. Anyone would like to comment on that? Brototti, you were talking about coal and the kind of yeah, government. attraction of coal in, uh, in, in, in the Indian uh, context. Would you like to start? To win again. Yeah, I could start, yeah. <coughs> so I think there is this idea, that these are again uh, dominant economic ideas, this idea of trickle-down effect, that uh, it's okay even if uh, for a while you are going to be paying the price of development, but in the end everything is going to come to you. And this is the narrative which I think a lot of the right-wing authoritarian regimes or the yeah, right-wing populism regimes talk about. First, that this will come to you, just wait a little bit longer. It's okay if you're being dispossessed right now. We have a plan. Let's just wait a little bit longer and then everything's going to be fine. And the other, the other strategy that they use is the strategy of othering and the strategy of, mm -hmm. uh, of the problem is somebody else's. And here you also see the, this, this rise in right-wing populism directly linked with rise in more xenophobia and more anti-immigrant politics. There is a very interesting book written by Andreas Malm, which links, I think, seven or eight countries where it shows a direct linkage between right-wing populism and climate denialism. Uh, and, and the way in which we from, from degrowth or from environmental justice work and thinking and action talk about is that we cannot keep on waiting for people in positions of power to do the action. So it has to be more about direct and deliberate democracies. This is what the work of the environmental justice movement also kind of shows that in different places, these different alternatives bring out a richness of what do we understand by the good life or what do we understand by, uh, by well-being and prosperity and what are the ways in which those different models with, let's say, municipalism with, let's say, more localized forms of governments can bring about. I think it is quite clear that we cannot wait for world leaders to solve the issue and reduce injustices because they have too much 
at, at power or they have too much to benefit from dispossessing and destroying the lives of many people from the majority world. Does anyone like to, others like to yeah. respond? Yeah, Ksenia, please. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, that when looking at, let's say, projects uh, that were maybe welcomed by local communities sometimes, issues related to environmental justice and health, for example, uh, is seen as a process. So at the beginning, what was promised, no? And then the process of dispossession and uh, toxic pollution and people start to have uh, problems, uh, health related, for example, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a process. So in the end, all they, although they, for example, were in favor or voted for a specific pol political party that was pushing no? uh, for the extractivist projects, um, this can also change in the end. And then uh, all these issues related to those projects be, become visible as well. So we don't look at environmental justice or conflict as one particular moment. We look at it as, as a process. So I wanted to add on that. Thank you. I think we had another question in, in the front here. I think, yes, okay. Please, please go first and then I've noted you as well. Please. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, coming back to your discussion on the roles of researchers. Um, it's my impression that a lot of researchers, at least like in this part of the world, uh, mostly limit their engagement to the more isolated institutional context um, instead of more like frontline participation. And I was wondering uh, how you think one can foster a more direct engagement among academics. Thank you. So a question of direct engagement mm -hmm. versus being isolated in our ivory towers. Mm -hmm. I think there are multiple ways. Uh, oh, yeah, oh. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are multiple ways in which we can do that. This is also something I have been thinking of a lot. Um, so one way is to look at the different players who are who are involved in injustices. Uh, Joanne gave this example of protest in front of the Total Energies building in Paris, but also at I have also seen other examples where there are big corporations uh, who are in this part of the world, who are accessible more to people here than people where the actual injustice is happening. And then they do, there is this thing called uh, shareholders acti shareholder activism, which is basically you get, I don't know, one euro share so that you can go to the shareholders meeting and disrupt it and say what you're doing in India or Bangladesh or Ecuador is wrong. And we are here to talk about this. So I think there are multiple ways in which if you start looking, if you start talking, there, there are often grassroots NGOs looking for support on how maybe it would make sense to have something published in a national newspaper so that more and more information is, is out there. So I think there are ways in which you can always, like once you start looking, there are always ways in which you can engage more. Thank you. Joan, you have a very, very long history of mm -hmm. direct engagement, you could no, say. No, it's not true. I mean, it's not true? No. No, okay. Because, <laughs> because, you know, this, it's, it's, it's easy to talk about being a scholar, activist, and Jumbo Ras from the ASA in the Netherlands. He's from the Philippines. He's one of the founders of Via Campesina, and he's a top professor now in the ISS, in the Hague, in, in peasant studies, or agrarian studies. And he really, he has the credit of being, having been an activist, but you cannot be really a scholar activist unless when you are a bit old. Because we, but I have been a kind of, of amateur activist sometimes, from, well, in politically because I was born in 39, so I, I suffered 35 years of Franco, so I was like a really marginal activist in politics against Franco, which Franco was not aware of this, and, and <laughs> himself. And uh, so, but politics I have been interested. And then I was very influenced by activists in Latin America, in Ecuador especially, but in other places. Now in Colombia, for instance, the government, at least Gustavo Petro himself, he quotes Georgescu Reagan and he, and he says, I read, I went once to, he's been in prison, he's been in, in the, in the guerrillas and so on, in the moderate ones, 
And then he said, once I went to Louvain to do a summer course, and he said, read Latouche. So he quotes Latouche and Georgescu Regan in his speeches, and he has more credit as a kind of political activist that I would ever have. But even if it is difficult to be an activist, a researcher at the same time, one has to try, because many reasons, because of the knowledge of the activists, they know more than the academics of their own things they are doing. For instance, things like leaving fossil fuels underground, this was invented in Nigeria by Nemo Basi and the people who survived the killing by Shell and by the military of Kensaro Weaver and other people in the Niger Delta. Mm -hmm. This is a reality. Nemo Basi invented the slogan, leave oil in the soil. This was copied in Ecuador. And Correa himself boycotted it, but by some activists like Esperanza Martinez and other people from Acción Ecológica. So these are realities. So it was researchers, no, it was not researchers, it was activists or activist researchers who invented this kind of policies uh, which now are so relevant, isn't it? We cannot take all the oil, the coal and the gas at the present speed mm -hmm. uh, from the earth. And there is a consensus on this, almost consensus. This was new in when they started in 95 or 97. They went to Kyoto to the parallel. I was not there. I could have been there with Habana. I could have been there then, but I was not. But they went to Kyoto with Habana saying, leave all in the sun. Of course, nobody paid any attention, mm. even worse than no attention, too much attention from the police, probably. So this is a very good question, but I don't think there is an easy answer. But one has to try. Mm -hmm. to give support and so on. And when you, one comes from here, or from a northern country and, and so on, there is all this question of what role can you have when you go to the majority world mm -hmm. and they may suspect you to be a spy or, or, or an anthropologist, I don't know who it is, <laughs> <laughs> or a journalist. <laughs> or, or, well, this is a question that people worry about positionality, isn't it? You have to worry about positionality until you, until you have a position in life. And then you can stop for a while. No. <laughs> no, no. Mm. Thank you. You Thank have you to worry all your life. I believe you have to worry yeah. all your life about your positionality. Yeah. Mm. Yes. All right. We worry about positionality. Um, we have one more question here. <clears throat> I'm Nils Johan from Copenhagen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm worried about the tendency to discipline the research. Of course, we have good research around the world. We have examples here also. I'm worried also about the tendency to criminalize, criminalize uh, actions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not at least, I'm um, worried about the tendency with social media and their... Look, look over the article. Colonizing, maybe try to colonizing our consciousness, and let lead me to <clears throat> the necessity of having social imaginations about our future, about organizing communities, communities as a kind of autonomy where they can have their own right to organize into the planetary boundaries. Of course, we have such examples. We have Sikkim in, uh, in Egypt. We have Tamera in Portugal. We have, we have Rojava in the north of Syria, and so on. And we need a uh, diversity of, of all these kind of communities. But I think it's so important that we still have this picture of how we can organize and have examples of them around the world. So my question is now, how we can link what, what we have heard today from the degrowth movement and from the south, all these actions we have example, many examples of, and uh, how can we uh, find a driving force, a social driving force who can now, I mean, 
it's two minutes to, to 12, if you understand. How can we mm -hmm. uh, identify uh, this tendency? My question, thank you very much. Hi. Thank you for that. We still have 12 minutes to 12, but I understood your point with the <laughs> stay watch. We have 12 minutes left, so <laughs> I'm happy about that. Uh, anyone would like to respond? Yeah. Ksenia? I, yeah, I can start with criminalization of uh, activists and other groups, um, especially as I show, showed in my presentation or in the Arctic countries with such a different level of um, democracy, let's say, we, we still find criminalization of activists and this is uh, in, in particular true for um, historically marginalized people. Um, so uh, women, indigenous peoples and that have been going through all these processes as protocols of othering, who has the privilege to protest and who has the privilege to say that uh, their lives and their health has been uh, deeply affected by all these uh, projects no, that we are seeing uh, around the world. And also, uh, especially with the, with the publication of uh, yesterday in Nature Sustainability uh, by Dalena Tran and uh, myself that I co-authored, is also this global violence that we observe towards uh, women environmental defenders. Also, uh, we had... Um, a uh, featured map in, in the Atlas on environmental racism in Europe and also the role of state in producing uh, environmental racism towards Romani communities in Europe. So these are also in the, when we analyze environmental conflict, conflicts and environmental justice, so um, the violence towards historically uh, oppressed people, it's uh, much more likely in in the process of um, environmental conflict or calling this um, environmental and social justice. So uh, I would add on that then again, it's very important to understand the struggle, to understand the, um, the issues, uh, to understand the risks and um, working um, together with the communities and support in um, in whatever we can uh, from academia and beyond. Yeah. Can she say something? Yeah. Yes, please, Joan, and then afterwards. Yeah. Uh, no, but to, to answer th on, on this question, of course, there's a lot of criminalization, and so this movement cannot grow as much as it would do in many places in the world. Let's say, Philippines, if you pro complain, you are not unlikely to be in prison or killed. But apart from this, I think that we could also answer your question, how to organize, which I don't... Uh, uh, we should have... Because another question would be, is there a movement for environmental justice? And there are many movements with an S of environmental justice, or perhaps all this is an intellectual and does not exist at all, and the world is going all right, and this will complain because people always like to complain, or they are nimbies and so on. So there are these three positions. Mm -hmm. I doubt between the first position there is a movement and the one there is there are movements, isn't it? The others is not an organizing force, it's a product of this. The others makes visible things that already exist, isn't it? But how should we organize? I have only one answer. How do feminists organize in the world? Because the, is there a feminist movement in the world? Well, this is not the topic today, but I think that there is a feminist movement in the world. And there, are, there is a very nice book, good book by Lucy Delap from Cambridge on this, the history of the... And she said only I had 400 pages, but if I had 4,000 pages, I would explain feminists all around the world, from Iran no? to Argentina to everywhere now and in recent history. And how do feminists organize? It's almost a silly question, isn't it? How do they organize? They don't, depending on the topic, depending on the situation, who, is there a Politburo or the feminist movement? Is there a central committee? Is there a Marx and Engels or even a Kropotkin of the feminist movement? Well, there are 
famous women who have written and who inspire the women at the local level. At the, uh, no, there might be movies, there might be everything. It's a movement with slogans and the 8th of March and so on. It's the only movement in my lifetime that I've seen prospering and growing, isn't it? And many people in the audience, especially the men, we know, we know about this. It's quite obvious. And there is a counter movement, like Vox in Spain, for instance, a counter feminist movement. So important that there is a counter. So this is how we should organize, is it? Not organized at all. First are the actions, no? First are the grievances, the claims, the actions, the connections, and the, the feeling that you belong to a movement and that you have like a positive view of future history. This is how we see it. A very, a very, very short, brief, yes. very short mm -hmm. point. You see, what we saw in my experience in Latin America, South America, is that with the withdrawal of the state of social factions because liberal policies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people self-organized mm -hmm. for education, for health, and so on. They appeared. They were there, <laughs> these movements. But once they became competition to the states, started the repression. Hmm. Because then it becomes a, a struggle about, a, about who has the power. So we have always to be aware that there is a, a strategic and a tactical where, a, because of the withdrawal of the state, these movements will appear. And they appear and self organize until uh, they are perceived as a challenge uh, uh, to establish power. Mm. And then they are repealed, criminalized or other ways. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, it's now 5 to 12, more or less, and we have to give the last word. Uh, well, for a few minutes to Juan before we have to stop. I mean, we could have sit, sat here for hours, I think. I suppose but, because Juan. a ritual, a ritual that I have the last power, the last word. But uh, I think, continuing with this, I think that in the degrowth movement, to which I am sort of uh, very sympathetic and even uh, officially like an uh, inspirational grandfather, so to speak, although the real grandfathers are Bolding and Georgescu Regan, who wrote a book, uh, was published in France, a book called Demain la Décroissance. Hmm? I believe on aujourd'hui la Décroissance, but I see in the degrowth movement that there is also perhaps this tension between the people who say, what we need are good public policies. Well, it could be the town hall in Barcelona, which just was defeated in the election, or could be at some middle level but could be the state also. For instance, how you have a minimum uh, income for everybody without a state, isn't it? So people who are a bit against the state, as myself, to tell the truth, that think that the state is more repressive than helping the people quite often, especially if you think in many countries in the world, uh, and in history, uh, have a problem. No? How to change the whole political economy into a more just, socially and environmentally international just economy with, uh, with the state or without the state. No? My tendency would be, or my thoughts are with Silvio Funtovic in this, but I see <laughs> some very close colleagues like Jason Hickel or even Georgios who are more, uh, more intelligent, I would say, and more more aware of the realities of life than myself, perhaps, uh, who believe the other day they were in the European Parliament with a big debate. Of course, the European Parliament is not the state, it's, it's la pagaille, no? it's not very important. But uh, on the growth, isn't it? Very satisfied with themselves, talking to Ursula von Leyen about the growth, who very politely listened and went away to some other business. <laughs> and, and uh, well, should we do this with the state? I think this is the real question. Mm -hmm. and, but of course, there is even worse things which is happening now. I think the world is moving back to what Hobson called for the world before 1914, the European movement, or also the Ottoman uh, is, you know, the age of empires. Mm. Mm. And now we are moving back, I think, in this year, since the Ukraine war, to an age of empires, 
which is still more state. States fighting among themselves, men or men, almost all men, fighting, nobody understands exactly why, like the First World War. I mean, the destruction of Europe in the First World War was made by a number of people who look, look like the Kaiser and the king of something, or the princes of Serbia, nice people individually, or the socialists in Germany, killing the socialists in France for four years with no particular reason, as we see nowadays, isn't it? And it was at the time, actually. But these were convinced that this was the way to go. So the world seems to be moving, not to a meetings of no, a deliberative Habermas meeting, <laughs> discussing about climate change and more cops and more cops, which are totally useless. But at least they meet every Christmas, uh, a bit before Christmas for another cop. Is this the world? Well, perhaps in a year's time we'll, have, we'll be nostalgic of this world of cops and people trying to make arrangements about the world because perhaps we're going in a totally irrational mm -hmm. direction of regional nuclear wars and so on. I am sorry to be so pessimistic on this, but this is what I see right now. So that's why it, the reaction of the people, of the greater Thornburgs, or the Disha Ravis from Bangalore, because it's not only in the north, or, or the girls everywhere complaining about climate change, the people, the poor, indigenous people, or the poor people, or the city people who are acting against this thing is what is so urgent. And with the state or without the state, this I am not sure. Mm. But without Politburo, I am quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We, we do not sadly have with us uh, one of the first Holberg Prize laureates, Jürgen Habermas, so he could yes. respond to yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> but we are sad to say that the time here is running out now, and uh, the symposium will be ending. There will be more opportunities to discuss um, with Professor Juan Martinez uh, Allier later on in, in this week, our Holberg Prize laureate. Thank you also to uh, Dr. Silvio Funtovic, Ksenia Hanacek, and Brototi Roy for having made this into a very illuminating and exciting symposium. And last but not least, I would like to thank the audience, both th those here in the flesh and those following this on their small or bigger screens from around the world for having contributed. Now in the Ola there will be served lunch and at one o'clock sharp in one hour and one minute there will be a Nils Klim seminar here with the Nils Klim laureate Simona Setteberg Nilsson here in the Ola at one o'clock. So welcome back then and thank you again to the audience and thank you to the symposiasts. <laughs>